Under the White Birches by Henry Van Dyke Men may say what they will in praise of their houses and grow eloquent upon the merits of various styles of architecture, but for our part we are agreed that there is nothing to be compared with a tent. It is the most venerable and aristocratic form of human habitation. Abraham and Sarah lived in it and shared its hospitality with angels. It is exempt from the base tyranny of the plumber, the paper hanger, and the gas man. It is not immovably bound to one dull spot of earth by the chains of a cellar and a system of water pipes. It has a noble freedom of locomotion. It follows the wishes of its inhabitants and goes with them, a traveling home, as the spirit moves them to explore the wilderness. At their pleasure, new beds of wild flowers surround it, new plantations of trees overshadow it, and new avenues of shining water lead to its ever open door. What the tent lacks in luxury, it makes up in liberty. Or, rather, let us say that liberty itself is the greatest luxury. Another thing is worth remembering. A family which lives in a tent can never have a skeleton in the closet. But it must not be supposed that every spot in the woods is suitable for a camp, or that a good tenting ground can be chosen without knowledge and forethought. One of the requisites, indeed, is to be found everywhere in the St. John region, for all the lakes and rivers are full of clear, cool water, and the traveler does not need to search for a spring. But it is always necessary to look carefully for a bit of smooth ground on the shore far enough above the water to be dry and slightly sloping, so that the head of the bed may be higher than the foot. Above all, it must be free from big stones and serpentine roots of trees. A root that looks no bigger than an inchworm in the daytime assumes the proportions of a boa constrictor at midnight, when you find it under your hip bone. Uh, there should also be plenty of evergreens near at hand for the beds. A spruce will answer at a pinch. It has an aromatic smell, but it is too stiff and humpy. Hemlock is smoother and more flexible, but the spring soon wears out of it. The balsam fir, with its elastic branches and thick, flat needles, is the best of all. A bed of these boughs a foot deep is softer than a mattress and as fragrant as a thousand Christmas trees. Two things more are needed— for the ideal campground, an open situation, where the breeze will drive away the flies and mosquitoes, and an abundance of dry firewood within easy reach. Yes, and a third thing must not be forgotten, for, says my Lady Greygown, I shouldn't feel at home in camp unless I could sit in the door of the tent and look out across flowing water. All these conditions are met in our favorite camping place below the first fall in the Grand Décharge. A rocky point juts out into the river and makes a fine landing for the canoes. There is a dismantled fishing cabin a few rods back in the woods, from which we can borrow boards for a table and chairs. A group of cedars on the lower edge of the point opens just wide enough to receive and shelter our tent. At a good distance beyond ours, the guide's tent is pitched, and the big campfire burns between the two dwellings. A pair of white birches lift their leafy crowns far above us, and after them we name the place Le Camp aux Boulets.
why not call trees people? Since, if you come to live among them year after year, you will learn to know many of them personally, and an attachment will grow up between you and them individually. So writes that Dr. Amabilis of Woodcraft, W.C. Prime, in his book, Among the Northern Hills, and straightway launches forth into eulogy on the white birch. And truly, it is an admirable, lovable, and comfortable tree, beautiful to look upon and full of various uses. Its wood is strong to make paddles and axe handles, and glorious to burn, blazing up at first with a flashing flame, and then holding the fire in its glowing heart all through the night. Its bark is the most serviceable of all the products of the wilderness. In Russia, they say, it is used in tanning and gives its subtle sacerdotal fragrance to Russia leather. But here, in the woods, it serves more primitive ends. It can be peeled off in a huge roll from some giant tree and fashioned into a swift canoe to carry man over the waters. It can be cut into square sheets to roof his shanty in the forest. It is the paper on which he writes his woodland dispatches, and the flexible material which he bends into drinking cups of silver lined with gold. A thin strip of it, wrapped around the end of a candle and fastened in a cleft stick, makes a practicable chandelier. A basket for berries, a horn to call the lovelorn moose through the autumnal woods, a canvas on which to draw the outline of great and memorable fish. All these and many other indispensable luxuries are stored up for the skillful woodsman in the birch bark. Only do not rob or mar the tree unless you really need what it has to give you. Let it stand and grow in virgin majesty, ungirdled and unscarred, while the trunk becomes a firm pillar of the forest temple, and the branches are spread abroad a refuge of bright green leaves for the birds of the air. Nature never made a more excellent piece of handiwork. And if, said my lady Greygown, should I ever become a dryad, I would choose to be transformed into a white birch, and then, when the days of my life were numbered, and the sap had ceased to flow, and the last leaf had fallen, and the dry bark hung around me in ragged curls and streamers, some wandering hunter would come in the wintry night and touch a lighted coal to my body and my spirit would flash up in a fiery chariot into the sky.